So it's a real pleasure to be here at Ian's retirement do. It's a thank you for the invite. Uh, I hope I can do it justice. Uh, so I'm going to tell you some about some of the work we've done at St Andrews, and obviously the link to St Andrews is quite clear for Ian because that's where he did his first degree. And one of my colleagues, John Walton, remembers Ian fondly, and we've seen him. Ian's been up many times uh, since I started up there, and I've got a little picture later on to to say that a little bit about that. So. What I'm going to talk about or tell you about is what we've been up to, I suppose, in a way. So running through, running through the group, the backbone of the group, it started off with natural product synthesis. And it was very much the sort of polyketide things, but obviously a little bit smaller because my group is a little bit smaller. Uh, uh, and, but really trying to work on natural products where we could achieve something and take that natural product and then try and do something with it and see where we could go with it from a biological perspective and that's a, a theme that's developed and this has enabled us to move into the idea of designing chemical probes to elucidate uh, protein targets and but also addressing biological problems through through synthesis. Uh, alongside that I've also taken the opportunities to move into slightly funkier areas for for me as it as it started so we've worked in brush polymer drug delivery systems for Alzheimer's targeting therapies uh, also moving into flow biocatalysis, bio really taking advantage of enzymatic transformations, which uh, a lot of my colleagues in the, the biomedical science research complex have, have developed these or found these enzymes and then really trying to get a handle of them and what we can do with them to actually make useful products. So, for instance, the, the inositol synthase is uh, we've taken that and be able to make chiral inositol derivatives on reasonable scale, we'll talk about gram scale, uh, overnight uh, by breaking the symmetry plane from uh, glucose 6-phosphate. But also looking at making uh, CMP sialic acid in one step overnight, sort of breaking the backbone of uh, sugar nucleotide synthesis by, by using uh, immobilized enzymes. Right, so I suppose to give you a back uh, snapshot back to the 6080. I, I talked about this project and this is, is still the longest running project in my group. So it's a project I started in 2005 and it's still going. Uh, we finished the synthesis quite early, well, well quite early, six years in. Uh, uh, but then what we discovered was it actually had some interesting biological activity. It was, it was a potent uh, inhibitor of T. brucei, the, the causative agent of African sleeping sickness. And that got us thinking because we weren't expecting it, and that got us involved in a whole load of biology with Terry Smith, uh, a collaborator who's a, a good colleague. And then we started to drill down and try and understand the shape and structure and see what's responsible for the activity. So we got down to these sort of simplified triazole type derivatives. Uh, and I think we got to JM425, I think it was about 6080 when I was there. So we then optimized that a little bit further. We got to Alpha 46. So all the, all the students have names, so that, that's the the numbers that come back, come with. Uh, so Alpha 46 led to Alpha 72, which is the photo affinity probe, which we enabled us to isolate or identify the ATPA, so complex five as the as the uh, the biological target in this system. And fortuitously, around that time, uh, John Walker from Cambridge published the structure of the the T. brucei ATPAs, and that enables us to move into a sort of more design phase, so we can actually start essentially very crudely in an audience of medchems for a synthetic natural product chemist, we started throwing structures in gold at, this stru at the, the x-ray and see what fitted and that basically got us to these sort of bis type compounds. So this is just one example, uh, MKZ Maria's Zakharova's compound where we have this bis compound which really has quite low uh, activity towards the bloodstream form of the parasite but also has very good selectivity, which is really what we're looking for. And we've actually moved further, further on with greater simplification where we've got a one micromolar compound with essentially 500-fold selectivity. So that's just, an, just to give you a demonstration where we've taken what is a relatively uh, greasy-looking uh, natural product and transformed it into something which is becoming a little bit more medchemish. I would say a little bit more medchemish. I wouldn't say it's medchemish. 
at all, but it's on its way. <laughs> right, so what I want to do today is tell you two little stories, or try and tell you two little stories, depending on what Nelson allows me to do and the rush for coffee. Um, um, and we start off in Langook Island. Aren't you tell me that's wrong? Yeah, so it's an island off the north coast of Germany, which is very popular for holidays. And Rolf Muller did a, a collection there. And he basically isolated these family of compounds, these pyranosols. And these are quite unusual compounds, I thought, when they first came out. They've got uh, oxazoles, a chloropyrrole, and a, a dihydropyrone type motif, or lactone at the top. And from my point of view, that looked like a really interesting scaffold to try and develop and see what we could do with, do with it. And their biological activity was uh, not very good. They didn't do much. Um, it was like, well, let's see what we can do with them, or what they did, they screened it very, uh, they didn't screen it against very much. Um, and so we, we set about trying to make these molecules, and uh, following Rolf Muller's isolation, uh, Marcus Kalesa completed Perennial B in 2017. So we were like, oh God, he's made it, what are we going to do now? Uh, so this is our strategy, uh, and we, look, we took it quite simply and just basically split it in two, uh, looking at the oxazole as the key framework to build up. And that all went swimmingly well to a point. Uh, so we started off by basically making the, uh, the, the chiral bit, the, the, the probably key type bit in a way, by doing a sort of, sort of a Belkin arm directed mucky arm or aldol, which set up the stereochemistry one, which we could then cyclize and, and then convert by myrine salt to the the enol ether. So that worked really well. We then strip off the protecting groups, then fortuitously, to aid our characterization, this crystallizes the TFA uh, derivative, which then confirmed the stereochemistry at that point. And then for the, the chloropyrrole, we relied on some really old classic novel argyl reaction <coughs> chemistry, which worked beautifully to basically allow us access to the, the two differentiated protected uh, chloropyrrole units that we wanted to bring together. So this is where it started to go wrong. Uh, so we couldn't really couple these very well. Uh, so the sort of direct coupling was a sort of 24% yield. Uh, say goodbye to all your material type stuff. Um, and then we eventually got around that a little bit by basically protecting the primary alcohol, the tes ether, and then uh, amidation. So that improved the yield a little bit, but then when we do the, the, the cycle of dehydration with DAST, then we get hit with a 52% yield to get to the oxazoline. So we weren't particularly chuffed at that point because we'd just been burning through material and Ross, who was the guy working on it, came to me one Friday afternoon and says, I'm just going to do this. And I said, why are we going to do that? Because that ain't going to work. And lo and behold, it worked like a dream. So he basically uh, couples on the app, the, the 131 acid derivative, and then he does a direct Northern Argyle off that derivative to basically uh, introduce the double bond. So that worked really quite sweetly. Uh, and then the dust cyclization slipped around to get the oxazoline. But then, again, we hit another problem. We can't oxidize that oxazoline up to the oxazole. So essentially a, a bit of a dead end at that point. But a slight tweak as we go back and then just oxidize the alcohol from the top point, using another laser pointer. I'm scared of using a PC. Uh, <laughs> uh, so then we, we oxidize it with Des Martin, get to the aldehyde, and that basically cyclizes under the sort of classical whipped oxazole <coughs> synthesis conditions. With the presence of DBU, we get 7% 7, 7, 7 over two steps. And I'm like, oh, geez, this is just not going to work, is it? Uh, and then, effectively, Ross had seen that this was being... It was working well, but then when he put the DBU in, it all was going to pot. So when he didn't put the DBU in, essentially he gets a 79% yield over two steps. So I didn't need the extra base push. So all was looking good at this point. Uh, and what we found is that we actually didn't get the product we're looking for. Uh, we actually got the double bond isomer, so this is not essentially the pyronazole A2, so another member of that family. And 
we then took that forward. And this is where this story sort of meets a really sort of frustrating end. So I want your advice on how to solve this problem. So we've been hitting our head against a wall in this step, which is just a reduction to take down that <coughs> the primary alcohol for about five years. We've got over 200 mgs of this stuff in the fridge. Uh, and we can't produce it. We can't touch it with lithal, dibal. It just sits and looks at it. It doesn't actually do anything. Uh, and even when we went through to the, the T-butyl thioester derivative, we repeated the same <coughs> chemistry all the way through with the T-butyl thioester. We end up with the same problem, that we can't actually reduce down the thioester down to the primary alcohol. But we're still sitting there. So if anyone's got any ideas, or you want to try some material to try it out, I can quite happily send it again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is the, the sort of summary of where we're at. Uh, essentially how we built it quickly up, but we actually took this product and tested it against our, our T-Brew site, and it actually comes back as being quite active, sort of 14 micromolar activity. I haven't got Nelson sign yet, but I'm worried. So, pre-coffee awakening call. Uh, so, bacterial infection, so a slight change of tack. So obviously antimicrobial resistance is a big problem, and one of the things that have been working with compounds or diseases which affect Africa, it became clear that antimicrobial resistance in Africa is a bigger problem already than we acknowledge in the, the developed world. And bacterial treatable disease causes about 5.7 million deaths per year. And in Africa, so bacterial infection accounts for about 25% of all mortality. Uh, and really, one of the challenges is trying to how to address that. And obviously, the WHO have their AMR most wanted list, uh, which includes gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria. And amongst those gram-positive bacteria, the, the big ones on that list are sort of C. difficile, uh, uh, MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococci, all the big ones that are quite same associated with hospital-acquired infection. And how does that feed into what we're doing? So in 2015, a colleague of mine uh, Ulai schwartz Leinick basically discovered a whole series of <coughs> proteins which are expressed on the tips, the pili tips, of, of gram-positive bacteria. So these are the, the fibrils which are responsible for basically host adhesion. So basically the bacterial cell tumbles along, binds to the cell. And this has a thioester of all moieties in there. It's basically formed from a glutamine and a cysteine. And it closes and expels ammonia. And this is viewed as being a sort of covalent linkage or bacterial warhead for basically adhering to cells. So whereas the sort of general view of designing an inhibitor for adhesion was based on sort of interactions of van der Waals radius or hydrogen bond interactions, this is actually forming a physical linkage. And this has been found in about 40 uh, thioester containing surface proteins across a range of gram-positive bacteria, and this is like defined by this red domain here. I've got five minutes. God, oh, right. <laughs> right. So, and it's found in all the goodies. It's found in uh, streptococcus pyogenes, the one that causes strep throat, uh, Clostridium perigines, Cornobactin diphtheria, Bacillus anthracis. We were fortunate enough to get that one. Uh, and C. difficile. Uh, so, Uli has basically crystallized these proteins, and he's basically got a whole family of these protein crystal structures now. And what you find is that in that pocket, it's a very narrow <coughs> pocket. It's responsible for sort of binding a lysine type residue from, from a system. And really trying to look at methods to inhibit adhesion is where we're heading with this. So to give you a demonstration of how this sort of process works, that if you take a, a native cell and then you basically put it with a sort of thioester construct with some tagging and you can tag it onto a green fluorescent protein, you can basically, if I can, where's the laser point thing? So here, if you have the A549 cell, as this one is, and then you have the, with the TED and the TAG, under conditions where there's no inflammation, inflammatory conditions, you don't see any response, i.e. the cysteine alanine mutants the same, or where you don't have the, the TED at all. So as soon as you promote a sort of inflammatory response, i.e. the cell feels like it's being attacked, you can basically see that the, the thioester binds onto that system quite, quite readily. The mutant, there's no activity, 
and obviously the control that's nothing. So, so another thing we looked early looked at in terms of this collaboration was basically taking a, a system which doesn't express a thioester. So we looked at a, a lactococcus, which not, natively doesn't have a thioester, and he looked at the effect of the SFB1, so the streptopyogenes uh, system, the, the thioester domain from there, along with the, the cysteine alanine mutant. And you can see this essentially the binding of the, the expressing SFB1 systems onto the fibrinogen systems of this mutant uh, engineered lactis, lactococcus strain. You can see it binding onto these fibrinogen fibers. Whereas the one way it's basically essentially got a dead TED, it doesn't bind at all. So this is a positive way or a positive outcome of this sort of process. So we got involved right at the start of this in terms of designing sort of these uh, simplified inhibitors to basically cross-link these thioester domains. So this is our full first generation type probe, which has got a rather crude coumarin on the end, which enables fluorescent tagging. It looks very similar to Ray's compounds, the sort of side chain, this sort of covalent linker. Uh, and this worked quite well, but not good enough. Oh, two minutes. Right, so, so what we moved into is sort of malamide based tags, so the, the sort of classical cysteine cross-linking type systems, and really tried to look at a family of leads where we looked at various sizes, but keeping them relatively simple to probe the little size effects. And we could see the effects on the, the SDS page in terms of if we have a, a, a strong lower band, that means we've essentially we've got good cross-linking. And then obviously we went to sort of a mass spec analysis. So we can see here where we take the, the wild type on its own, but then we expose it to the, the cross-linking agent. We basically move it up by the, the expected mass units. And then we do MSMS MS analysis and we trips in digest. And essentially we can pull out the peptide sequence with tag linking the two amino acids. And then the final part of this was to basically try and move to some, or eventually try and develop a fluorescent assay process. And we've done that by using these... Uh, strain promoted click type reactions basically with the, on the same type of construct to basically get to these type of systems where we'd expect to see the fluorescence in the one where we basically get it to work. So essentially that's where we are in terms of a, a rapid update on this project. And this is where we want to go. And I know I'm getting passively aggressively <laughs> looked at. <laughs> so, so this is where we are in terms of this project and these are the ongoing efforts in terms of Callum's work as he as he wraps up to finish his PhD and we're looking at bringing that forward and trying to move that forward in terms of developing ultimately developing an anti-adhesion type therapy slash drug as a, as a possibility obviously I need to thank everyone who's done the work because I sit in an office uh, uh, and thank both past and current but obviously and my collaborators and obviously the people that have done the funding but also to acknowledge uh, the impact of Ian on my career in terms of guiding me and everyone in this room to where they are today. Uh, and this is a, a most recent trip because in June 2019 when Ian came up to St Andrews uh, down on the beach. So thank you Ian, thank you the organising committee, thank you everyone for your attention and hopefully I'm on time. <laughs>